Well, let's get started. Enjoying the conference this year. This is one of my favorite conferences in the United States, and I love to be a part of the community. And I love to be a part of the All Things Open 2020 as a speaker this year. I would also like to thank the organizers for putting up such a great show and also the sponsors for helping us out uh, to put such an amazing conference this year. End-to-end -end testing with Cyprus. This is you. This is me. This is our team. And we're really, really happy right now. And why are we happy? Because we just got the requirements for one of our brand new projects that we're going to go do. And the reason why we're really happy is we know that this means we get to choose the technologies, we get to choose the team members, we get to choose the processes around this brand new Greenfield project. So we're all pumped up and now we're going to go implement features. So what do we do? We get the requirements from our clients and deliver value piece by piece. And we start with delivering these small features, which then add up to a bigger feature of our project. Now, over time, our project becomes bigger and bigger. We add more and more features to our project. It's still very exciting because we get a lot of feedback from the clients and they're really happy about what we've delivered to them so far. This keeps going. This keeps going until the Greenfield project slowly turns into a Brownfield project. We start seeing a lot of things like this. We fix one bug and a different bug appears. And we fix that bug and the same bug that we fixed earlier appears again. And this could be frustrating. The initial excitement, the initial enthusiasm that we all had is not there anymore. And that could be a little frustrating. So what do we do? That's when someone comes and talks to us about the testing pyramid. So with the testing pyramid, we had no idea about the testing pyramid before. So now we do, and we're enthusiastic again. So we know, all right, let's go try to automate all our tests. And let's start with automating the bottommost layer of writing a lot of unit tests that we can run much faster, and which is going to give us faster feedback, uh, faster feedback throughout our technologies. So we invest a lot of time into writing a lot of unit tests. And then we figure out our units work really well individually, but when you put them together, they don't really work. So what do we do? We say, okay, let's go try to invest a little more in our service level and also into an end-to-end -end testing solution. So we get enthusiastic once more and we go and execute on writing uh, automated end-to-end -end tests. Now, as we're working through this process, someone from the upper management comes to us and says, hey, I think we got to hurry this up. The deadline's approaching, we got to deliver value, and these end-to-end -end testing efforts are taking a longer time. So we got to hurry this up and deliver things faster. And that's when we start feeling like this again. It could be frustrating. Sounds familiar? Who am I? My name is Avindra Fernando. I'm a software engineer based in Kansas City. And I work for a company called uh, Balance Innovations. We're part of uh, a, we're a Brinks division and uh, focus on building web applications and also focusing on 
uh, driving some of the testing efforts at my current place. So uh, you can follow me. That's my Twitter handle, uh, my Medium, and my GitHub uh, handle as well. Setting up an end-to-end -end testing solution can sometimes be challenging. If you're someone who's driving the initiative to sell this idea to management, you're going to run through some challenges that you'll have to overcome. Because we know with our current end-to-end -end testing solutions, we run into a certain set of challenges. The first one I would like to highlight is flaky tests. These are tests which pass most of the time, but when it's very critical, when it's very crucial, when we want to release that one hotfix, this test fails. And what do we do? We have no choice but to disable that test in order for us to release our code to production. And we see this happening to another test, and we ended up disabling that. And this unpredictable flaky behavior is going to cause us to lose confidence and for upper management to lose confidence in our end-to-end -end testing solutions. The second challenge is end-to-end -end testing solutions usually take a long time compared to other testing solutions out there. I've worked at places where the feedback loop, I've coded a feature, and by the time I heard back any feedback related to that feature, it was months after. And most companies have gotten really better at this now. The feedback loop is not, not months. But the point is that a developer, once they finish implementing a feature, they only get feedback after a while because some of these tests take a long, long time to run. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to context switch and stop what you're doing, go back and investigate that bug that you worked on. And that possibly even involves you resetting the environment to a certain state. So a lot of context switching, and I think a lot of loss of productivity at that point. And finally, I think we're familiar with sleeps, waits. So we expect our APIs to give back a response within a certain number of seconds, but that one fine day, that API takes two minutes. So what do we do? We increase our timeout, we increase our sleep to two minutes. And now we're 90% of the time, we're just wasting a lot of time arbitrarily waiting for API requests or network requests to come back. And that could be very costly in terms of time. If you're someone who is driving the initiative to implement an end-to-end -end testing solution, an end-to-end -end testing effort within your company, it gets really tricky when you have to justify the time spent versus the costs incurred to the company. So this is a long-term investment. So it's very critical. The current tools, the current software out there provides us a lot of value so that when we try to justify these requirements to the business, it's much more seamless. And that's when you thought you were just falling off a cliff, Cyprus comes to your rescue and says, don't worry, I got your back. Most of us today are involved in working on web applications and Cyprus is a perfect end-to-end -end solution for working with web applications. So I wanted to highlight why Cypress. Prior to Cypress, if we were choosing an end-to-end -end testing solution, it was not one solution which solved all of it. We had to choose different 
frameworks. Things like what style of Tessa are we going to write? Mocha, Jasmine, Karma. What's the assertion library that we're going to use? We have to make a choice on that. And then still very popular end-to-end -end testing solution out there is Selenium, which looks at our application from the outside and helps us make certain requests. And if we select Selenium, then we need to select an implementation or a Selenium wrapper, popular ones being WebDriver, Nightwatch, and Protractor. And then we may also need some additional libraries like SignOn or TestDouble for mocking. A lot of design decisions, a lot of choices that we have to go make. With Cypress, all of this legwork has been taken care of. It's a all-in-one testing framework that provides us all of these abilities and all without using Selenium. Cypress has some really cool features that I wanted to highlight. The first one is time travel and debugging. So one thing I want to give kudos to Cypress, which I love about Cypress, is its UI. It's this amazing UI that you can interact with and get a lot of feedback, get a lot of meaningful information when you are working with Cypress tests and when you're debugging Cypress tests. So here we see a Cypress test on the left-hand side and we see the Cypress runner on the right-hand side. So what I can do is I can add something like sci.pause. And when I run the test, it actually pauses at that point and helps us debug step by step into what this test is doing and what the current state is when the test is running at each step. It's really cool. The second thing, the second feature is really amazing. And in today's web development world, I don't think we can ever live without real-time reloads. We write the code, we expect our application to refresh and display those changes real time. Cypress has the same ability. As you're working through a test, you can get feedback on the Cypress runner real time, which is amazing. Third feature is automatic waiting. I mentioned in a previous example about waiting for an arbitrary amount of seconds. This results in a lot of time wastage. So Cypress actually knows how much to wait and when your network requests come back. And this is because of the internal architecture of Cypress. It can track when you are making a network request and when the response comes back. And because it knows this information, it knows exactly how long to wait. So you don't have to keep guessing when an API is going to return its response. So really cool feature. Network traffic control. A few things that we can do to monitor and track our network requests. The first thing is you can spy on those requests. So with spying, what you're really doing is you actually make the network call. You actually make the API call, but you can listen in on what request was made and what response is coming back. Now, if you want to make things a little easier and faster, then you can go to the next step and do stubbing. With stubbing, what you're doing is you're basically mocking the API response. And for some scenarios, I think this is really valuable. So that way, you know the contract, you know the shape of the API, you know the shape of the data, which was supposed to come back, and you can mock all of that and Instead of making a real API network request, you can make a stub request using Cypress. Finally, Cypress has the ability um, to fast forward time and they call that clocks. So for example, in your code, for some reason, let's say you have a set timeout, which where you have to wait for a few seconds. What you can do when your test runs is you can fast forward time using the Cypress clocks. So they call it ticking the Cypress clock. 
Cypress also comes with a lot of bundled tools. It comes with Moment, it comes with Sign-On, it comes with Lodash out of the box, and also comes with jQuery style uh, querying to access elements. So a lot of these, these tools come out of the box, so we don't have to worry about adding them to our ecosystem. Screenshots and videos, really cool when it comes to debugging our tests. Cypress, you can configure it to take screenshots at every single step of your test and also generate videos that we can go review as the tests run. So this is a huge feature that I really love about when we try to execute these tests and when we debug these tests. And these are, uh, you can turn them off, you can turn them on. If you need the videos, you can have them or otherwise you can, you can turn off that setting. So how do we get started? NPM install Cypress and you save it. And that's going to get us started with Cypress. What you'll see is when you add this to your project, you will see a folder called Cypress with these files and subfolders. So the first one you're going to see is a Cypress JSON file. This file contains all of the settings related to Cypress. The second folder that you're going to see is the integration folder. And this is where you're going to be putting all of your spec files or test files that you're going to be running, uh, you're going to be writing for end to end tests. There's another folder called fixtures. Fixtures is where you're going to be storing all of your mocked data and mocked implementations for APIs. Plugins is if you want to extend the functionality of Cypress, then you can do that ability. And then all of those custom plugins that you'll be writing, that you'll be consuming, you can put them inside of the plugins folder under Cypress. And finally, under the support folder, uh, you can put a lot of the shared commands and utilities that you'll be needing um, for these tests. So for example, you'll, you'll start to realize as you're writing these Cypress tests, there's going to be a lot of repeated functionality. There's going to be a lot of repeated code. So it'll be nice if you can abstract it out and put it in a common place, put it in a common util that Cypress can consume or make it into a shared command that Cypress can execute. So you can do all of that and you'll be storing all of those inside of the support folder. Once you get it uh, set up, you can run it um, using the executable or you can run it using uh, NPS, NPX Cypress open. And what this is going to do is this is going to open up your Cypress runner, uh, which is going to show you a list of the tests that you have. If you are running this in a CI environment, you can use NPX Cypress run, and that's going to run it in your command line tool or your terminal uh, agnostic of a visual tool that you can see. So once you do Cypress open, when you first get started, this is a screen that you're going to see uh, basically shows the structure of the folders that I was talking to you about. And um, it's going to show you the list of tests that you have, and you can step through each one and run them individually, or you can run them as a, as a batch. Is everyone ready to get started? Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go look at an application, which is a simple to do's application. What it allows you to do is create a to do item, mark an item as completed and mark an item as deleted once it's complete. And then we're going to use Cypress to run some tests against that application. So along with all of you, I want to invite the minions to come along to take a journey to go look at uh, this application. So what we'll do is fire up our application. So this application allows me to create two new items. So I can create item number two, 
item number three, mark the first one as completed or deleted. Uh, I can mark the second one as completed and I can uh, delete other items as well. So a pretty simple uh, to-do application. So now let's go ahead and run Cypress against this application. So I've fired up Cypress here. Uh, let me bring it over to this window. So what you do is using NPX Cypress open, you're gonna fire up your Cypress runner. So this is how your Cypress runner is gonna look. Uh, basically it's going to show you the list of tests that you have and you can run them individually or uh, you can run all of them at once. So I'm gonna, sel I'm gonna select, uh, let's run all of them and see what it does. So then it opens up a Chrome window and we can see it doing its magic. So each and every step that you see on the left-hand side are steps of the tests. So it's creating elements, it's marking them as completed, it's deleting them, it's resetting the state. It's doing a whole uh, bunch of things for our tests. So what I can do once the tests are completed, I can see that it took 22 seconds. So there's quite a few tests here. And then I can hover over each one. And this is a really cool part about Cypress. So let me zoom in here. So here's a before each hook which is visiting a reset page. So it's making sure it's starting off with a blank slate. Then it visits the home page. Then it waits for a second. Um, and then it checks to see what the heading of this to-do item is. So um, one more test. So we can look at what that's doing. So. It's really cool. And uh, so this is a state where it's loading and I can see that my loading data, it's in a loading data status. So I can see a snapshots for each step as I click through on what Cypress is doing as it runs these tests. So let's dig in uh, further. So let's go back to our tests and look at each one uh, step by step. All right. So our first test. So if you're writing your very first Cypress test, one thing to be one thing to note, it's, it's going to look very familiar, familiar to some JavaScript tests that you've already written uh, in the past. So the syntax here is the first step is you define your test suite. And that's so I've decided to call it my first test. And you wrap it using a describe block. And then your test comes inside of that. So it starts with the word keyword it, or you can start with the keyword test. Uh, either one, uh, whichever you prefer to use. And you give it a name and then a function that it invokes uh, as a part of the test. So the first thing Cypress does is it goes and visits your homepage or the URL that you provide so that it can go visit it. So one more thing that you'll see in Cypress tests are uh, the Psi global object. So that's what Cypress uses to execute these commands. So anything that you see, you'll see a lot of these psi dot uh, global, global that you're going to be using as you run, write, and invoke these Cypress tests. So if you remember in my application, there was a big giant heading called to do's. So what I want to do is I want to validate when my application loads, it's showing that heading. So what I can do is I can use a sci.contains and grab an HTML element and check for its value or text. 
So here it's saying sci.contains h1, which is the HTML element, check to see if it has a value to do's. And it does in this case, so it's going to pass. There's another way of writing the same exact thing. Uh, instead of using a string, you can use a regular expression to check for partial matches and things like that. Now, there is a slight issue in this test. This, this is a very good first test. But what I'm seeing here is I'm having Cypress grab my H, very first H1. Now, the issue is if I do add another H1 to my page, then as long as this is the very first one, it's going to work. But if I add something on top of that, then it may continue to, it, it's not going to continue to work. So what we can do is it's good practice to ensure that you give a unique identifier to your HTML element. So what you can do is you can give a data attribute. Uh, in this example, uh, we're calling it data uh, hyphen psi. And then you give it uh, a unique name, and then you can query by that. So here, it's essentially uh, still using the psi.contains, but instead of h1, it's actually using the unique identifier that you gave your element and then checking uh, for its value called to do's. So let's take this a step further. Let's try to add some items to our to do's application using Cypress. So I start my test. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to visit the home page using sci.visit. The next thing is I did see in my application an input box. So what I want to do is I want to gain access to that input box, type something in it, press the enter key. So we have to mimic all of that using Cypress. So you can do all of that using this step. To gain access to the element, you can use sci.get and using its class name or its ID, you can get that element. And then you can, Cypress has a function called dot type, which you can use to type any text, and then you can invoke keyboard, keyboard events. So here, uh, what I've done is I've typed the word first item, and then the enter key uh, is being pressed. So once I do that, I do expect the item to get added to the list. So then I can run my assertion. So I can say sci.contains find the to-do item that I just added, check whether its value is first item, and then I can go a step further. Uh, not only that its value is that, but can you also make sure that it's visible to the user? So you can use the should directive and then uh, be visible. It's essentially checking if it in a visible state. So meaning it's not a, a, have a CSS property called display none, or visibility hidden, it's actually visible uh, to the user on the screen. So second one, I can do it one more time. I can add another element called second item using sci.get to gain control of the input, dot type to type the value, press enter, and then sci.contains uh, using uh, gain access to where the item would have got created, check its value, and also check if it's visible. Now, I do have a refactoring opportunity. If you notice, in each of my tests, I am visiting a URL. Now, why do I have to repeat that every single time? So the good news is you can use the before each hook, and you can put sci.visit in there. So essentially, what this is doing is before each test, it makes sure that we are, Cypress is visiting that URL that you provided and then run the tests. OK, so we're going to see all of this in action. So here in this video, it ran really fast. So what I've done is I took the video that Cypress generated, and I've slowed it down so that I can, uh, I can show all of you uh, how, this, how this works. So let's go back and play it pretty slowly to see what Cypress is doing when it's running this test. So first thing, um, it visits the home page, and we can see that it's now 
starting to type first item and it presses the enter key, it gets added to the list and then it adds a second item and then it gets added to the list and my assertions run to check whether they're visible and uh, we should be we should be good there. There's another refactoring opportunity. In this case, I'll be adding a lot of items, uh, even if I want to test uh, a remove scenario. So I can extract that code out to a function, call it add item, and then basically have that sci.get new to do type and have my text be dynamic. So then if I'm running a test to remove items, what I can do is instead of typing out all those statements over and over again, now I can simply use add item. So I'm adding an item called simple, I'm adding an item called hard, and then I first check if the item simple exists, and then I find the destroy element, which in my case was, if, if you remember, if you hover over, you have the red X, which appears, and then you find that element and then you click on it. We're using force equals true here uh, because I don't necessarily want to hover over uh, when I'm running this test. So I want to make sure I found the element and I click it. Because uh, if, if you remember in this case that the X only appeared when you hover over uh, the element. So now I can run two more assertions. I can check if the item simple is not there anymore because I deleted it. And if the item hard still exists because I didn't, I didn't touch that one. So now let's see these in action. So Cypress ran pretty fast. I'm going to go slow it down. So it first creates an item called simple, then creates an item called hard and then deletes the item simple and you're left with the item which is hard and all my assertions pass. I do have another refactoring opportunity. In this refactoring opportunity, what we're going to do is we're going to abstract out the homepage URL that I've been visiting before every test. So then what I can do is in my before each hook, I can just run relative paths. So we know our application's base URL in this case is localhost 3000. So I can abstract that out, put it onto my cypress.json file, which is housing a lot of configurations. And now in my test, I can have my before each hook just visit root. And then I can visit relative paths relative to uh, the root. So another cool refactoring opportunity. So what about network requests? Uh, we can take care of that too. No problem. Cypress got you covered. So the first thing is I want to illustrate what we would traditionally do using another framework. So when you're making an API call, you most likely would not know when the API call would return data back. So what you want to do is you added an arbitrary weight. You can still do that using Cypress. So you first visit the page, uh, then you wait for a second, and then you check, um, you assert of what your expected values are. But this is not ideal. There's got to be a better way. And with Cypress, you do have that better way. Because Cypress runs a browser inside of its own Electron app, it's able to take control over the network requests which are leaving your application and coming into your application. So what we can do is we can use something called SPY. So essentially using SPY is you can look at the network request which is going out of your application and coming into your application. So what we want to do in this case, First, you uh, initiate the Cypress network server using sci.server. Uh, and then you can basically tell Cypress to look out for this URL. So in my application, the to-dos application, we saw that 
when I visit the to do's page, it's actually making a call to an endpoint called to do's to retrieve a list of to do's so you can preload them. Uh, in, in our case, it was an empty array. Uh, so that's essentially what it's doing. So here, uh, you're going to tell Cypress that keep an eye out for that URL, and then you give it an alias uh, called to do's uh, just so that you can keep track of that at a later time. So now, when you visit the home page, then you can tell Cypress, wait for that network request to finish. So in this case, it's you give the directive at and to do's, which is essentially the alias that you call that request. Uh, and then you can check when it completes, what does it is response body had? So here, uh, in this case, we were expecting an empty array to come back. So I'm checking if the response body has a length of zero. And then no uh, items got populated. So at the very end, we can see sci.get uh, the to-do items. And then you check if it has the length of zero. So this is how you would spy on network requests and take control over it. Uh, you could also do one more thing. You can use stubbing. Stubbing is when you take it a step further. Instead of making the actual network requests, what if you could basically mock him? And you can have that ability using Cypress. It's going to look very similar to how you did the spies. The only difference being you're actually going to provide a return value here. So here you can see sci.route and what's a request type, which is get. The path is slash to do's. And the return value is going to be an empty array. So here, if you stub the request, Cypress is not going to make the actual uh, network call. Instead, it's just going to return the mock response that you told it to return when it encounters a call to this specific endpoint. So um, the mock data could get uh, pretty large. So what you can do is you can put your mock data in, a, in the folder called fixture, fixtures. And then you can reference it uh, like um, this way. So essentially what you're saying here is you're telling Cypress that find the response to this network call in the fixtures folder. And I've named it, the file name is empty hyphen list. And then you prefix it with fixture colon. So you're saying when you encounter the network call to the endpoint to do's, then return the contents of the file empty list, which can be found in the fixtures folder. All right, so let's run this and see. Let's run all these tests. So here, I want to point out something very interesting. So we can see My very first test is actually the very the slowest one. And the reason for that is we that's the test we put in an, an arbitrary wait of one second. So it still hasn't completed. And there you go, it just completed. The other ones run much faster. The spies and the stubs that we did uh, run much faster. Okay. How do I take control of a request which is going out of my application? So you can also do that. You can, if you are posting, if you're hitting a post endpoint, uh, then you can check what request got sent to the server. So here, very similar to what we did with spying. Uh, now we're going to say sci.route, it's a post request to an endpoint called slash to do's, and we give it an alias. And then, once we, we know this gets invoked when I type something in the input box and press the enter key. So I do all of those actions and then I can do sci.wait and I give, I reference the alias, which is new item, and I check its request body uh, to contain a certain structure. So should have contain and the structure of the object that I sent to the server. And I can also validate that the response came back. In this case, the response also is the exact same. So I'm just validating if the response uh, came back from our server. So we can see that in action. Uh, here, if we slow things down, 
we can see that when it's posed to a new item, it typed the word test API, and then it did the assertion, which is essentially checking what the flavor of the, the data object that you sent to the server is. And then it's also checking for uh, the response back from the server. One of the other common things that we, we would like to test is the ability to test the loading elements. With Cypress, you can do that as well. So here, what you will do is because the test runs so fast, it's really hard to get a hold of the loading element to validate that it was once present in the DOM. So what you'll have to do is you're gonna have to purposely add a delay. So you can do that here using the side.route command and you actually configure a delay in here. So here in this example, we've given it a delay of two seconds and we've mocked the response. So it's a stopped response of the empty array. So when Cypress encounters a request to this endpoint, then it's going to on purpose delay that call by two seconds so that you can actually see the loading element. And then it responds back after two seconds with an empty array that you've, you've mocked. So then we can run our assertions. So in line number 13, uh, we, can, we can see that we're checking if the loading element is visible. Uh, and then we wait for our loading request to complete. And then finally in line number 19 here, you can see that we're, uh, we're checking if the loading element is not visible anymore. So um, if I run this using Cypress, you can see here real quick, uh, once the request is invoked, so it's still going and I can see the loading data um, label uh, over here. So that's essentially uh, our loading element. And then once the request comes back, that's gonna go away after two seconds and then my test would be completed. All right, so all of this stuff is great. So who's using Cypress? So what I did was I went to the, I went to NPM and checked for downloads. And I saw over the period of since when um, Cypress got released, that we started seeing a linear increase in the Cypress download. So it's gotten a lot of adoption and I can tell a lot of more and more companies have started adopting this technology as their end-to-end -end testing solution for their web applications. So over 6.5 million downloads uh, as, of, as of today, since uh, when <coughs> it started way back, uh, way back a couple of years ago. So I didn't stop there. I actually went to the GitHub repo and I checked for activity. I checked the number of stars, how many people have forked it, how many pull requests are out there, and the number of contributors. And I can see it's a very active repo in the community, which is, which is a great sign. So that gives me a lot of confidence in if I wanna adapt a technology like this for my end-to-end -end testing needs. So I wanna leave everyone with a quote, which is dear to my heart when it comes to testing. Quality means doing it right even when no one is looking. This quote inspired me a lot to drive some testing initiatives in the places I've worked at so far. Thank you so much. My name is Avindra Fernando and hope you enjoyed the session. And I would love feedback so please provide some feedback and I hope you find a lot of value in adapting Cypress for your testing needs. Thank you. I hope uh, all of you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, post them on chat uh, or Q&A. Uh, and I'm gonna be posting the slides right now uh, on the chat and I'll also uh, post the slides on Twitter uh, for your reference in the future. Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, there's a question. Um, for end-to-end -end testing specifically, was it is it better to run against a real life server or uh, mocking? I think um, I think my recommendation is it it really depends. I would recommend the critical scenarios or uh, the smoke test type of scenarios uh, running against a real live server. Uh, but then some of them, I think we can afford to do it uh, by mocking them. So I would I would recommend using spying and uh, stubbing and using a mix and match approach uh, for your application. Uh, I see one more question in Q&A. Uh, how do you uh, compare Cypress to other leading uh, JavaScript test runners? I haven't um, really seen an end-to-end -end testing specific JavaScript uh, test runner. Um, so I, I don't really have a good comparison there, uh, but I think if we were to compare Cypress to technologies like Selenium, uh, then I think for web applications, Cypress is providing a lot of value and it's able to run uh, run much faster. All right. Um, yep. Seems like that's all the all the questions. I'll go post the slides and uh, thank you all for for attending and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.